as soon as we are only having virtual sex and we're making our babies in tubes and everything else, which is not far away, um, are we really human? If, if death goes away, Ray Kurzweil told me years ago, 2006, um, he said, Glenn, you just have to stay alive till 2030. And I said, okay. And at the time I was doing the math, how old will I be? <laughs> and uh, I said, why? And he said, end of death by 2030. Excuse me, Ray, what? End of death. I said, we're going to cure all disease. What, what do you mean by that? And he said, oh, no. We'll just download you. We'll be able to take you and download you into a machine. And so there won't, you won't ever die. You'll still be able to be called up as a virtual person. And I said, virtual person. That's not life, Ray. That, that's, that's a pattern. That's not life. Um, he I mean, didn't that sounds understand. like ro robotic slavery right there once that gets in the wrong hands. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs>
to algorithms and machine learning and God knows what else. Uh, but before we dive into all of that, you've for a long time, I give you a lot of credit, my friend, you've been right about a lot of things way before. And I, and I told you when we first met, well before we had ever worked together or anything else, I would watch you on, I think first on CNBC and then on Fox, you'd have the chalkboard and I'd be like, I can't tell if this guy's completely insane, absolutely hilarious, a genius, a lunatic, like all of that stuff. But it turns out your track you were right on all fronts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what your next book. That's what my book about yeah. you will be on. Uh, but but in essence, though, with all of the the blackboard stuff and pointing to okay, here are the people doing this, and this is what's going on here. You've pretty much been right within within like a certain set of limits. You've been pretty much right about most of the stuff. I'm really wrong on timing. Um, that's where I really get it wrong. Um, however, it's not hard to figure it out. It's really not. Um, I, I will tell you anything that I got right, uh, I think comes more from God than me. Anything that I got wrong is definitely, <laughs> me. um, but, uh, it, it, you have to just take people at their word. And the first time that I was really right about something kind of profoundly scary was September 11th. And I, it was uh, August of 99, maybe. And I was on the air at WABC. And uh, it had to be earlier than that, because Clinton was still in office. And, uh, and he had just bombed the aspirin factory, if you remember that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what he was doing, he was targeting Osama bin Laden. I couldn't even pronounce his name. I'd, I'd never even heard of it. Osama bin, bin Laden, I think I called him. And uh, I said, uh, look, I'm no fan of Clinton, but this guy is scary. This, this is one thing that maybe we should pay attention to. And I got so much pushback from the audience. And I said, guys, he's saying he's going to kill us. Take him at his word. Okay, you're wrong if he, if he doesn't, but at least you're prepared in case he does. And I said... Uh, within 10 years, there will be blood, bodies, and buildings in this city, and it will have his name on it if you don't pay attention to him. You just have to take people at their word. Yeah, and geez, you, well, you, you certainly turned out right on that one, and, and you've been ballparking a lot of the other stuff that is, we're going through right now. Your last book on the Great Reset, uh, really what's happening everywhere in terms of this giant globalist government that seems to perhaps control both parties right now, but certainly control the Democrat party and everything else. So is that, is that a good place to start as we enter this dark future? Just sort of what's going on politically here at the moment without getting into just what happened today yeah. or yesterday. Yeah, in, case you're, in case you're dead by the time we post this and I don't want right, to. I mean, you know, and then I, I would say, you know, something like, uh, that whole Kamala Harris taking office thing was a surprise, and then it didn't happen. It'd yeah. Be tough. Anyway, um, the um, I think the problem, Dave, is or where we should start is the normalcy bias. Um, the normalcy bias gets humans into trouble. Uh, it also saves our lives on day to day. On day to day, you need you need. Um, you know, we, we are, we are, a, we have trained ourselves to look for dangers. And if we were looking for dangers, we would find them all the time and we'd be freaking out all the time. So we have what's called the normalcy bias. That kind of fits into the normal pattern. So I got it. And so you don't even really think of that threat, um, you know, in your frontal cortex. So on September 11th, is a great example. What happened there was a lot of the people that could have gotten out were making their way down the stairs out of one of the towers, and then they turned around and went back up because they had to turn off their computer, they had to, they forgot their purse or whatever. They just assumed they were coming back um, because it was too big to handle an airplane going through their building. They, they it just it didn't compute. So the normalcy bias to keep you calm happens. That's what's happening in our world today. People are just 
pretending, and I think it's natural, that all of this is normal and it will it, it's still within the normal parameters and so I don't nothing's really going to happen and that is we are right now in the stairs of the twin towers and it's coming down you just have to prepare and be aware of it otherwise it's chaos and panic you know it's so up. it's so interesting to me that you're framing that it that way because you know I'm very proud to say that when when covid happened I was very early on on being skeptical like once the the 15 day thing hit when they said 15 days to stop the the spread on day 16, I was basically done. And the reason I was done is because of a word that you just said. Everywhere, every news organization, every commercial, every uh, public service announcement kept saying the new normal. It's the new normal. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys just told us 15 days will be good to go. And then overnight, the new normal. So, so that has something I think to do with another word you mentioned earlier about timing. That these things sort of happen in a way where we don't realize how much we're giving away as we're giving it away. Because we are geared to safety in the herd. And that's why the individuals, the preppers and everybody else, the people who have already made a move to a safer area or one with a stronger community sense, they're the ones that are going to survive. I mean, Dave, I think I asked you at one point, maybe a couple of years ago, at what point do we realize, or at what point do we become the German Jew that just kept saying, it, it's not going to get worse than this? Uh, I mean, it may not get worse than this. I pray to God it doesn't get worse than this. But we are, we're traveling the same road. I mean, if you look at the Weimar Republic, the Weimar Republic went through this exact same thing. It it had its September 11th. It had the Second World War. All the churches were like, we're righteous. We're going to win. Don't worry. It dragged on, humiliated, bankrupt the uh, country. Then the younger group, the older group, didn't recognize their country anymore. And a younger generation came in. And a lot of the power flipped from the older generation to the 20 and 30-year-olds. Then they got rich because during hyperinflation, they weren't married and didn't have to run out to the store. They could invest it. So they got rich. Um, and then, like crazy promiscuity, I mean, it became Babylon. Berlin became Babylon. And most people don't know that in 1925, the first trans surgery happened in Germany. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he had several surgeries from, 20, uh, from 25 to 29 he died when the final surgery put a uterus in him. Um, but the scary thing is, Dave, on both sides, and I, wanna, I really want to spend a little time making sure it's very clear on this. The first books to be burned were the LGBTQ books that were being put in schools. Pedophilia had started up. And all of the stuff that we're experiencing right now, where there was just a... a disengagement from reality and right and wrong. Uh, and so by 29 and 30, the churches, which were dead inside, they were just righteous, but not Christ-like at all. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were starting to ring the bells. The Nazis came in. The first book burnings were from that literature. The first people in the concentration camp were, were generally gays, anyone who uh, was said that they were trans, any of that stuff. They were the first. This should be a very big warning to both sides. One, anyone who says, you're a Nazi for being against these, you're book burning. I honestly don't think they know history, but I do. And that should wake all of us up. If we don't know history, we will repeat it. So, they have a reason to say, hey, Nazi, you know, back off. We have to be very careful. Do you think it's baked in that we repeat it no matter what? That this is just what the human experience is and that we cannot, to some degree, as, as a society, we cannot escape these mistakes that we seem to make over and over and over again because of the slow motion nature of some of this? 
I don't think it's inevitable, but it sure seems uh, very, very likely. I mean, I, I remember reading, <laughs> I remember reading the Bible. You first read the Bible, and you're like. Okay, and they destroyed themselves. And then you read three more pages, and it's a new society, and you're like, wait a minute, you're doing the same thing these same guys thing. were just doing. Right, and you're like, hello? I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Look it, this is it. This is how it happens. Um, and we're living it. Um, I don't think it's inevitable. I think we can change it. I think, you know, people are just more likely to go along with the flow until it's just unbearable. And at that point, you know, I, 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 I'm doing an art workshop up at my ranch, and I've got these great artists from all over the world. Some, if I were walking with some of these guys in India, people would stop us. Uh, but we have these great artists, and we're painting, and painting things that we want to do but push us beyond our limits. And... I, I want to tell the story of Raoul Wallenberg. I won't tell it. It's a long story, but um, it's... We'll, we'll, uh, we've discussed it on the show before. I'll, we'll link to the previous discussion on Raoul okay. Wallenberg, yeah. Um, but he's fantastic. And I'm inspired by this, this painting of this woman and man, and she's all in her mink and everything, and he's in a top hat and tails. And you can see behind them all of the theater postings. They were going out to the theater. And then a cop coming down the stairs, and it's shot on the shot of them, and the two faces. She is just really like freaking, and he looks like I can't believe this is happening. And the name of the painting is Friedrich closed. Do you know what that means? And I think a lot of people are going to kind of come to that point. Who are, wait, wait, because we're already going down that way. What, I'm a terrorist. For speaking out at my school board, do you know what that means? So as, okay, so I think some people are waking up to it. Certainly your audience is, is hearing this stuff. My audience, we, we talk about this and, you know, clearly there's been some pushback. A guy like Glenn Youngkin won in Virginia because he stood up against, you know, stood up for the parents and things, things of that nature. But let's connect this a little bit to some of the stuff the book's about in the title again, which, cause I'm a big sci-fi guy, Dark Future. I mean, it just sounds like a movie that I would have run to have seen with Schwarzenegger in, you know, 1987. Um, because now so much of our information is sorted by machines and AI, and you just mentioned you're hanging out with a bunch of artists right now. I mean, artists are gonna be hanging on by a thread now with AI art. It's crazy. I don't know if you've gone on to any of those sites where you can basically just put in a couple keywords and come up with art that is, to be honest, incredibly, unbelievably inspiring and awesome. And it's not, re you know, in essence, it's not real. Like we're just running behind machines almost at every front right now. So, and it hasn't even begun. Yeah. We, are, uh, we are now at the very beginning of what's called the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is going to take, the, the first industrial revolution began in 1760, 1770, somewhere in that. So imagine what life was like in 1770. You're still crapping outdoors. There is no such thing as a sales manager. Um, uh, you, there's no electricity. It's not great. Uh, all of the changes from the first industrial revolution till about 1880, where we discover electricity and we get refrigeration and lights and everything else to the, uh, to the information age and the space age. Then the third is the technological uh, difference and the information age really kind of coming together. All of that from 1770 to about 2020, that whole change, that kind of an impact is going to happen in the next 10 years. And the displacement is going to be uh, beyond understanding. The problem is we could make this, we could absolutely make this, if we had governments anywhere in the world telling people the truth. Right. They're telling you about climate change. That's bullcrap. And even if it isn't bullcrap, it's at least 100 years away. Okay, And we could technologically figure out ways to, to um, best it in the end. Man will survive. But what they're not telling you is your life is about to dramatically change to where 
the uh, people like Yuval Noah Harari is uh, the, he's talking about useless classes, millions and millions of people in a useless class that can't do anything but eat. Um, what, gee, what do Dave, you make? I, uh, let me pause you there for a second, because what do you make of a guy like him? He's big, sort of in the WEF circles, and a lot of people hate him. But in an odd way, you just said he's telling us a very dark truth that there oh, will. He is. Yeah. He is absolutely right. You need to pay attention to him, but uh, let's not take any final solutions from him. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, you can be right diagnosing the problem. It doesn't make you right uh, in the solution. Sure. Um, and he is, he is with too many people that, I mean, this is very Malthusian, what's happening at the WEF. Um, you know, everybody still loves George Bernard Shaw for some reason, but he's the guy who first came up with a gas chamber. He's the guy who said there's got to be an easier way to kill groups of people because they're not useful to us and they have no reason to live. Um, thank you. Thank you, America's greatest playwright um, but uh, or English playwright. Um, they're going down the same road. We, I, I believe, Dave... We are seeing now all of the things the Nazis wanted to do, we are now technologically able to do. We're able to make the Uberman. We are able to weed out the incorrect genes. We're able to round people up and categorize them quickly. I mean, the only reason why Germans were so effective in killing Jews was because of IBM. IBM it developed the punch card system. IBM was at the concentration camps every week working on, on their computers. They knew what was going on. Imagine what could be done today. That doesn't mean it has to happen. It just means I don't see a lot of our better angels in powerful positions. So when you see the, what I would describe is, as uh, weakness or actual connection to China, uh, weakness against China or connection to China, say from the Biden administration, and then you see what's going on in China right now, social credit, 15 minute cities, uh, you know, people's face, you do, you do something that they don't want you to do, your face is now blasted in effect in Times Square of China all day long so people know not to associate with you. It is quite literally a, an episode of Black Mirror, which I recommend everyone watch. But basically, the book is, is telling us this is what we're importing right now. Oh, so we're not importing it, just like we didn't import um, eugenics. Um, we didn't get any of that stuff from Germany until after the war when we did Operation Paperclip. That came from us. I contend if we lose our way now, our technology will make us the, the greatest evil force ever on the face of the earth. Um, and you, you look at these, all oh, these companies that have such high ESG scores, yet you're in bed with China and you're willing to write anything for China. You're, you don't care about the slaves. Please don't talk to me about slavery in 1850 when you are writing programs to enslave people today in China, um, we, are, we are now entering territories, and we talk about it in, in the book Dark Future, um, where, where it's almost these mad scientists who are so reckless on um, AI or AGI or ASI that they... They, they, they feel like they're, I think they feel like they're making a God and they so want to talk and converse and be in the presence of omnipotence that they'll create it and somehow or another they think they'll be okay. We have no idea. We are dealing with an alien life. Uh, and I mean, I, I've seen the movies. This isn't a good thing that you just run into. You know, it's funny, I'm listening to you, and again, I'm a huge sci-fi guy. The, the list of sci-fi movies that have predicted all of this, whether it's the machines taking over or the algorithms taking over or, or quite literally the last couple alien movies where they're trying to create 
the, the perfect organism. And of course the organism is gonna realize, guess what? I don't need you. And therein lies the rub. So, so what, you, yeah, go ahead. Have you seen Mission Impossible yet? Glenn, you are not gonna believe this. I have never seen any of the Mission Impossible movies. It just, <laughs> it's so funny you ask wait, me that. Wait, wait, wait. Do you like The Princess Bride? Yes, I love The Princess Bride. I was gonna have to question our whole friendship. Oh, 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 inconceivable. <laughs> no, of course, I, something happened. You know how sometimes in life you just get behind on one and then yeah. Mission, and then it was Mission Impossible 7 and I was like, it's too late for me, what can I do? <laughs> it's not, it's not. It's really, Dave, it's it's uh, it's kind of like, uh, what's that stupid car movie? Oh, Fast and the, Furious, I've never seen any of those. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen one. I think I could pick it up at, what, 23, and I'd still get it. Um, but I know, anyway. I know they're doing something very fast, and they're pretty pissed they, about it. Yeah, they're mad. <laughs> anyway, um, so the uh, uh, Mission Impossible talks about uh, a ASI. Do you, should I explain the difference? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it'll help for the audience, yeah. So AI is actual A-N-I. It's um, artificial narrow intelligence. It's intelligent on one thing. Right. I'll beat you at chess every time. You want to play tiddlywinks? I have no idea. Yeah. Okay, so I'm very narrow. That's what we have right now. We are natural general intelligence. We can do many things, talk about many subjects, be good in many things, and iffy in other places, but generally we can do an awful lot of things. We don't have that yet. This chat GPT um, large language model is the first one that is taking us into this realm and it's extraordinarily dangerous. It is miraculous and dangerous. Well, it's, it's incredibly uh, highly biased, which, which basically we found out the day it was sort of widely launched, which was fairly obvious to anyone that's Again, seen any sci-fi movie. I have said for 20 years, do not fear the machine, fear the people programming the machine. Yeah. Um, so the next step is AGI. That makes a, a computer as wide ranging as a man. And the, the, the difference between AGI and ASI, artificial super intelligence, we're not really sure, and I'm not sure it matters. Some people say we'll never get there. I believe we will. I believe we will shortly, as soon as it's online. Um, uh, when, you know, when you get to a point, and I believe this will happen in the next two years, you will soon have an assistant that is digital on your phone. The minute it is loaded on your phone, it will know everything about you. It'll get all of the data from everywhere. And so it will know you and it will adapt to you as you go. And this will be unlike, you know, Siri is the worst, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> Siri, where's the fire extinguisher? I found this on the web and it's something. <laughs> no. okay, stop Siri. Stop. Then scroll down. And turn stop. Oh my, you look, you gotta Siri. love it. Oh my gosh. So anyway, um, and communication. Uh, yes, and communication. This is something that you will believe is real, is, and it will connect with you personally. It will serve you. It will, it, it will become your best friend if you let it. And it's a machine. And I'm telling you, Dave, we're two to three years away from people saying no. You cannot turn that off. You can't. That's mine. And they are real. That's, that's a person to me. Once that happens, the whole world changes. Um, we are also in a society that has become a society that is reliant on experts. Um, look where the experts have gotten us. Okay. The experts have gotten our families to be, our kids to be in the highest suicide rate. All of these things they never have to account for. When a machine, when AI is said to be infallible, which will happen very soon, who's going to argue with it? How do you argue with it? How do you justify saying, I'm not going that way? Ray Kurzweil told me, well, people will just go. And I'm like, I, 
I probably won't, Ray. I probably will want to be, you know, remain natural and stupid. And he said, well, you would be a danger to society. <laughs> so now, now oh. I've gone from a useless person to a person who is dangerous to society because I can't keep up. Where do you think that goes? You know, it's so interesting because after three years of COVID and the craziness around mandates and vaccines and everything else, you really could see it in a very clear way how we're five years from now, they've got everybody just basically locked in the matrix, you know, one way or another through their devices or everything they're doing online and all that stuff. And then the few people who don't want to join, they, as exactly as saying, they have to then be considered the enemy because what are they up to that they don't want to be in the same system that we're in? And then we've found an awful lot about what the way we would treat people who don't want to do things the way we want to do them. Man is, you know, progressives believe that man progressively gets better. Um, realists know that progress is 100% individual. If the individual progresses throughout his lifetime, that's an individual choice. And if enough of them are progressing as individuals, spiritually, philosophically, then the society will progress. But once they die, it's a new choice for new little babies to start from the beginning. Um, we, we don't progress per se, and I think we will find out in, in record rate how uncivilized we really are when we are lacking energy, lacking food, whatever it is, we're still animals. How worried are you that even if the machines aren't taken over and, and literally exterminating us, that just what they could do in terms of what guys like you and I do for a living, just try to translate the insanity into something sensible for people, that that will be so cordoned off, maybe we're there already, that you will rarely ever meet anyone on this planet who thinks the same things that you do, or even roughly the same things, meaning that we will have all been so atomized and manipulated through algorithms and everything else, it will be impossible to agree on anything. So I don't fear the machine first. I don't think the first step is it takes over. I think that's a, a longer process, and I'm not sure how that happens, if that happens. Um, I do know that it becomes more and more powerful. Um, and with that power come people and people who are in charge of that power. Um, I, I think the dystopian world of even possibly 2030 is that you don't go anywhere. Dave, you and I talking to each other, each other if I am on some list, which I can guarantee you I'm on, if I'm on some list and you talk to me, your score goes down. And so we can't talk to each other uh, unless we don't, you know, unless we don't want to, uh, you know, fly again. There, there's this great uh, article I just, it's in the book. I'm trying to remember where I got it from. I think it's from UNESCO. Um, and it was written in 19, I mean, sorry, in 2019. And it talks about two people and this husband and wife. And, and this is their idea of a utopia of tomorrow by 2030, that he takes the rapid transit. He takes the train. I don't know why it always starts with the stupid train. And uh, Democrats are always like, we got to build a new train. Anyway, um, the, so they're, uh, uh, he goes to work on the train and he's in work within 20 minutes. However, she has to ride the bus, which takes up to three hours, which means she's going to be on the bus. She'll be late for work, blah, blah, blah. But she has a lower uh, social credit score. And it says she recycles. She does all these things. She does the right things. She raises her children right, etc., etc. But she's a journalist which requires her to talk to unsavory people with different, uh, uh, with different opinions, which lowers her score, so she has to take the bus for three hours every day. She's a journalist. Even a journalist will, be, will have points deducted if they talk to somebody who might have a different opinion. 
To me, I'm sort I read of that. okay with journalists being punished in this dystopian future. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're fully getting me on this one. No, but they will be punished by talking to people like right, us. Right, I know, like <laughs> us. That's the problem. Well, well, even that that concept does it strike you as uh, strange, or or why is it that for all the warnings about all of this in great literature and great science fiction and biblical stories, for all the warnings of going, you know, opening the Ark of the Covenant and figuring out what the ultimate power is, we still go to it. We all, there's still something within all of us. Otherwise, you, you know, you'd be probably living in, the, well, you, you have some locations in the middle of nowhere, but in essence, we'd all dip out if we were listening to the warnings. Well, I do have dip yeah. out places. <laughs> I think you do and you should if you don't. Um, I'm pretty sure you told me I could visit you on one of the dip out locations or you'd cordon off a little. I think there was I think there was a corner. I think it was a corner on the edge where the zombies would be hitting me first, if I'm not mistaken. Sure, sure. sure. I'll give you the address soon. Um, (laughs) Anyway, uh, uh, I, I think, first of all, where you're where you are is where you will be. You'll have about 72 hours to move. Um, you start to see a severe banking crisis. They shut down the banks. They shut things down. You better be within 72 hours where you want to be or because you, you may not move after that. Um, uh, the, um, the reason I think we don't take it seriously is the same reason. I mean, I say this. I say this in humility and also with the knowledge. It's been said forever. And I think this is why people don't take it seriously. I think I could see the return of Christ in my lifetime. I think that could happen. Will it? I don't know. I have no idea. Scriptures say you should be prepared for it. Am I really prepared for that? No. Why? Because it's probably not going to happen. Again, it's the normalcy bias. It, things like this, especially in America do not happen, but it can, and it is happening, and it's not normal. Would you connect some of this to uh, what people have lately been calling the crisis of meaning that particularly younger people are happening that are having, having in that they're so confused about things and their, their leaders and their elders and parents' generations and all of this stuff has failed them, that in a weird way, when lockdowns came around, when mandates came around, they kind of wanted it because it was just something. It was just something that was different than the thing. Or when you think about the Antifa soldiers and the BLM people, did they really want to burn down their cities and communities? Probably not if you really sat them down, but it was just something. And, and that impulse is a very strong impulse. Never really thought of it that way. That's terrifying, Dave. I think you're right. Um, I, I think there's going to become... I mean, you can't put the kinds of people out on the street, and we're talking 30% by 2030. Unemployment, double that of the Great Depression, and it's never coming back. You can't put those kinds of people out on the street and expect things to go well. So they better have a good handle on you uh, and a a way to keep you, as Naval Harari says, um, uh, medicated and online. Um, so I I think that there's going to be a couple of things could happen if we're really fortunate. Uh, one, there could be a great awakening, kind of like the Jesus movement of the seventies, which took the hippie movement, which was going downhill quickly into drugs and everything else and turned it into an uplifting kind of movement. Uh, the Jesus hippies, there's a chance that life be, has become so meaningless in a way that it did kind of in the 1960s that we will find meaning again. Um, also, there is... Right now, we're fascinated by things we can do that aren't real. You know, things that we can... You know, the the filters we use and the... And the way we, I mean, as somebody who has taken thousands and thousands of pictures with people, in the last five years, maybe three for sure, 
I have noticed younger people, when they take a picture of themselves or take a picture, they have, especially girls, they have this pose that they go into. It's almost always the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and it always happens. They're not individuals anymore. They're, that's who they are in photos. Um, and it's disturbing. But I think we have a chance of starving for reality. And if we don't start getting hungry for reality, we're going to be in trouble. So let's try to veer into that positive portion of this to, to wrap sure. up, if possible. Uh, because I know that for as scary as this is all, we'll all get and as dark as the future may be, I know that you will be playing through the entire time. I actually don't think that Glenn Beck will disappear off the grid or anything else. And, and Unless I die before this broadcast. Which again, if that happens, now. you guys, I'm, I'm telling my team, they're allowed to call me back on the grid. If some, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very disturbing, Glenn, really. <laughs> You're spending too much oh, time I'm, up there with the I'm artists. I'm trying them now just to call you and just freak you out. <laughs> what, what, would you, what would you tell the average person that's just going about their life? They're not that political. You They're not, are, yeah. Yeah, so um, don't fear. You know, um, I'm a religious person, so I look at the scriptures for a lot of things. If you've ever read the end of the book, it's a little freaky. However, it, it, it ends well, but that's not really happy. It's like, hey, you're going to be tortured for seven years, and then Jesus comes. You're like, okay, but what about the seven years? Um, I'm just telling you right now, the warnings are there to give you hope that it doesn't last forever. This won't last forever. Um, this is... This is uh, as they say about inflation, transitory. Um, and this too shall pass. I'm pretty sure that's in the Bible somewhere. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's actually, you are entering a time that no human being has ever lived. Right now, even if you are the poorest among us, I mean, if you're the poorest among us, I'm wondering how you're watching this on your phone, but I've seen it. Um, even the poorest among us are living at a time unlike any other time in space or, or, or time. And what an honor. The things that you're going to see, the technology, you know, technology is not all bad. I'm a fan of technology. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just feel we are running into headlong into trouble because of arrogance. Um, but you're going to see miracles on the horizon. You will see uh, disease, much of it, wiped out, possibly by 2030. Um, you're going to see intelligence and design, and you worry about global warming? Wait. The, the, the technology, when we get to quantum computing, we'll figure things out in about five minutes, maybe five minutes. Um, and but Elon's also, trying to get interplanetary life going. So th there's all sorts, and, and that will most right. likely happen within both of our lifetimes. Right. The only thing to truly be aware of that is game-changing ending is what Stephen Hawking talked about. And I do believe it's a real possibility. The minute we start augmenting ourselves, we, we fail to be human beings. We fail to be homo sapiens. Um, uh, and many will believe we're homo deus, that we're man-gods. Um, the minute we start augmenting, downloading, and uploading here, we, I mean, science fiction, the Borg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You become part of the machine, and the machine becomes part of you, and that could end humanity as we know it. As soon as we are only having virtual sex and we're making our babies in tubes and everything else, which is not far away. Um, are we really human? If, if death goes away, Ray Kurzweil told me years ago, 2006, um, he said, Glenn, you just have to stay alive till 2030. And I said, okay. And I, at the time I was doing the math, how old will I be? <laughs> and uh, I said, why? And he said, 
end of death by 2030. Excuse me? Ray, what? End of death. I said, we're going to cure all disease? What, what do you mean by that? And he said, oh no, we'll just download you. We'll be able to take you and download you into a machine. And so there won't, you won't ever die. You'll still be able to be called up as a virtual person. And I said, virtual person. That's not life, Ray. That, that's, that's a pattern. That's not life. Um, he I mean, didn't that sounds understand. like ro robotic slavery right there, once that gets in the wrong hands. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it, it just... Is Kurzweil, even... is he still on that quest that he famously has been on for the last 20 years? I mean, like, taking, like, he was taking every supplement, like, 3,000 oh, yeah. pills every day and all this stuff. Like, he, he really believes that he is going to do what you just said right there, live it's forever. Um, and I do believe also he's doing it to live by 2030. Um, but I also believe he is on another quest. And I, I'm not sure. I mean, this is an opinion and I'm not. I'm not saying this to accuse him of anything, but I think he's trying to recreate his father. Um, his, when his father died, he started collecting every bit of data he could find about everything that he experienced. And I, I do think there's something weird uh, going on, almost a Frankenstein thing with him. I could be wrong. And I like, I like Ray a lot. I've talked to him several times. He's a re I've told him myself, you are both the, the most exciting and brilliant person I've ever met and also the biggest horror show I've ever met. I just don't know which way it's going to end. Pretty sure those things come together in the package. That's, that's how they're sold by, yeah. the, by the other creator. Glenn, do you have any other thoughts in case this was your disturbing last interview? In case this is my last interview. To Dave Rubin, I leave my best regards. <laughs> I'd rather the acre on the thing in the middle of nowhere with the fence and the whole. I'll send you the address. I'm sending it to you now. Love you, man. Ciao. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of mindless drivel, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.